scheduled by Dan Winkler at the keynote, then you don't have anybody that wants to introduce you because they want to be over there. And I understand that. So I'm glad that you have chosen to be with us this evening. We're going to be discussing something that is a pretty heady subject. It's something that you have to give some attention to, and it's something I think that if we will be honest with ourselves, we have at one time or another, as we've been reading through the scriptures, hit upon the idea of God's dealing with people in the past, especially as it relates to God commanding people to be killed or God himself instructing people to be killed. You and I both know that when we read the story of Saul going into the Amalekites and being commanded to destroy everyone, to destroy the men, the women, the children, the donkeys, the oxen, everything, that something in us bristles at that. We think, how is it that there can be a God who is all love, who is absolutely positively moral in every sense, and yet God can order or cause or bring about or condone the death of innocent people who we would look at and seem like they don't deserve to be killed? I think we've all thought at least some about that and wondered how can that be the case. Now, instead of investigating it thoroughly, the atheistic community has seized upon the emotions of the idea and said, okay, boom, all we need to do is stop at the emotions and we're going to say that that proves the God of the Bible cannot really be the supernatural, perfectly moral creator of the universe. And you'll see quote after quote by these men Richard Dawkins is on record for a very famous statement, uh, you might say infamous statement, that he made in the book The God Delusion. There again, Dawkins is probably the most well-known atheist in the world. I quote these guys because these are the heavy hitters. These are the guys who are recognized in the atheistic community as the leaders of the process as the leaders of the atheistic community, as the leaders of the charge against Christianity, against the Bible, against God, etc. Dawkins says, the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all of fiction. Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving, control freak, vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. Now, if you were to take a breath as you read that rant against the God of the Bible, and you were to start to analyze some of the words that he has put in there, you would see this bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal. Those are words that talk about the concept of God causing the deaths or ordering the deaths or bringing about the deaths of certain groups of people. And of course, what Dawkins is saying is a God like that can't be moral if he's ever caused or ordered the death of anyone out there. Really, he's saying of anyone, but we're going to get into that in just a minute. Hitchens, Christopher Hitchens, of course, one of the four horsemen says, God is an evil monster whose actions and instructions in the Old Testament caused the ground to be forever soaked with the blood of the innocent. And you can, of course, see the position from which he is coming just based on the title of his book, God is Not Great. There again, the idea that God orders or causes the death of innocent children, and thus God cannot be a moral God. Dan Barker, there's not enough space in... There's not enough space to mention all of the places in the Bible where God committed, commanded, or condoned murder. Now, what you cannot do as a defender of the Bible is deny things that are in the Bible. Is it true that some 1,665 years after creation, after God initially said everything was good, things had gotten so bad that God sent a flood on the world. There are an estimated 2 billion people, and God himself personally was responsible for destroying every single life other than Noah and his wife, his three sons and their wives. Is that true? Oh, yeah. Were there innocent children that were alive at the time of the flood? 
Yeah, but did God bring about a flood that killed every one of them? Yes, he did. Does that make God immoral? Well, the atheist would say yes. What I'm going to show, is, show you this evening is absolutely positively no, it doesn't. As you continue thinking about this concept with me, you have to always come back to the question of whether the atheist even has any ground upon which to stand. You see, the atheist is telling you, okay, God is immoral, but when you ask the atheist, what do you mean by moral? You don't have a foundation upon which you can build a morality. You're saying here in this situation that some things are right and some things are wrong, but when you start looking at the implications of atheism, they admit time and time and time and time again, and I stress time and time again, William Provine, as well as a host of other leaders in the atheistic community, admit, oh, hold on just a second, yeah, we've said some things are right and some things are wrong, but we mean that relatively. Because there is no ultimate foundation for ethics in the system of atheism. Well, what does he mean by that? Dan Barker says, there are no actions in and of themselves that are always absolutely right. It depends on the context. You can't name an action that's always absolutely right or wrong. I can think of an exception in every case. Now, hold on just a second. I thought you as the atheistic community just said God is immoral because he has caused the death of innocent children and yet you're telling me he stood up in public in 2005 in a debate with Peter Payne and said there's not a single action that you can name for me that's always right or wrong. I can think of an exception in every case. So then Dan Barker, could it be sometimes right to kill an innocent child? Well, what would he be forced to say? You understand this man is one of the leaders in the atheistic community. He has been in 80 or more moderated debates with people who would believe in God. He claims that that is more than any atheistic debater in the history of the world, and nobody has seen anybody that's been in any more moderated debates. He's been in more moderated debates than any atheist in the world possibly, and yet he stands up and says, you can't give me an action that's always right or wrong. And of course, when someone stood up and said, when would it be right to rape a person? He said, well, if there were a group of aliens that said, we're going to destroy the whole world if you don't rape a person, then that would be morally right. In the debate that I had with him in 2009, I said, okay, could you, could you rape two girls? He said, yes. I said, 2,000. He said, yes. I said, two million. He said, yes. So this is the man who's claiming that your God is immoral, but then he is on the other side of the issue saying, you know what, hey, by the way, I can't say that any action is positively right and positively wrong. I can think of an exception in any case. Okay, maybe God is the exception there. Well, see, using his line of reasoning, he can't claim that God's immoral because he can't say an action is always morally right or morally wrong. Relativism you're looking at there. Look at Charles Darwin. He said, a man who has no assured and ever-present belief in the existence of a personal God or of a future existence with retribution and reward can have for his rule of life, as far as I can see, only to follow those impulses and instincts which are the strongest or which seem the best ones to him. You understand what he's saying? Look, if you don't believe in God, the best you got is whatever feels right till you do it. And I can't see, Charles Darwin says, how anybody could say anything other than that. Well, let me show you how that plays out in real life. Convicted serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer was convicted of killing 17 young men and boys. He admitted to killing 19, if I understand right. He was convicted 900 years in prison in an interview with Stone Phillips. Stone Phillips was talking to Lionel Dahmer, his dad, and Jeffrey, and he said, Lionel Dahmer, wasn't there a time in your family life where you didn't pass on a faith in God? Lionel said, yes, unfortunately there was. Stone Phillips said, do you think, Jeffrey, that that had anything to do with your reaction to relationships with people? He's, Jeffrey Dahmer said, yeah. He said, absolutely, I always believe the lie of evolution, and I believe that if you were just primordial slime, what one blob of primordial slime did to another blob of primordial slime didn't really make a big difference. And then here in Jeffrey Dahmer's own words, he said, if a person doesn't think that there's a God to be accountable to, then what's the point of trying to modify your behavior to keep it within acceptable ranges? That's how I thought anyway. He kills 19 people, and he says, you know what? I didn't believe that there was a God, and if there's no God, I can do anything I want. But guess what? While that is immoral and we know it, it is a logical implication of atheism. If there is no God, guess what, Jeffrey Dahmer? 
you hit the nail on the head. You could do anything you want. And that's why if the atheist does admit that there is something going on here that's objectively morally right and morally wrong, the atheist has just pulled the rug out from under himself. Because once you admit an objective moral value, just one, you have then demolished the concept of atheism. Atheism cannot live in the face of an objective moral value. So for the atheist to say, hey, your God is immoral because you just stop them right there and you say, wait just a second, you cannot talk about morality. Now it aggravates them, they argue that you can, but then when you try to get them to tell you why, they cannot tell you how and why they can speak about morality. They just simply cannot do it. Now, as we continue, here's something that you need to understand. A lot of the killing in the Old Testament and some in the New, Ananias and Sapphira you're looking at, was the killing of those who were guilty of crimes worthy of death. Now that is something that the Bible bears out on just a surface reading, Leviticus 18, 21 through 24. You shall not let any of your descendants pass through the fire to Molech. Don't defile yourselves with any of these things, for by all these the nations are defiled, which I'm casting out before you. Now we talked about in a previous lesson what this meant. The nations in the land of Canaan were literally sacrificing their children to an idol called Molech. Do you think that someone could conceivably be worthy of death if they consistently sacrificed their children on a statue to a, an imaginary God? Yeah, absolutely positively. If you're looking at Jeremiah 32, 35, and they built high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to cause their sons and daughters to pass through the fire to Molech, which I didn't command them. That didn't come into my mind, and it's an abomination. And then they caused Judah to do that same thing. Now, listen to Sam Harris. This guy, one of the most widely respected, most published, widely authors of the atheistic community, he says some propositions are so dangerous that it may even be ethical to kill the people for believing them. You getting that thought right there? He said sometimes you don't even have to wait for a person to do a bad action. You just ask them if they believe a certain proposition. And if they say yes, you could ethically kill that person. Now watch what he said. It may seem an extraordinary claim, but it merely enunciates an ordinary fact about the world in which we live. Certain beliefs place their adherence beyond the reach of every peaceable means of persuasion while inspiring them to commit acts of extraordinary violence against others. There is, in fact, no talking to some people. You see what he's saying there. Now, now let's see the statement that the atheists are making. God's immoral for killing people. Oh, hold on just a second. Number one, you can't make a moral statement. Number two, would you admit that there are lots of people in the Bible that were killed because they deserved it? Well, Sam Harris says, yeah, you know, I mean, you might could kill people not even for doing anything, but just for believing something. Now, in this situation, he's talking about radical Islam terrorists who they believe that it's right to blow up infidels. And if you ask them, do you believe it's right to blow up an infidel? And they say, yes, it might be ethical according to Harris to kill that person before they've ever done anything. But notice what he is saying. Yeah, it might be ethical to kill some people. Okay, so could it have been ethical for God to have killed some people in the Old Testament? Oh, absolutely, positively. Watch what Barker says. In a debate with Peter Payne, the one that we quoted earlier, Peter Payne said, all right, some of those guys were absolutely guilty of heinous, horrible crimes. Barker says, all right, I admit that. Yeah. Maybe some of those men were guilty of committing war crimes. And maybe some of them were justifiably guilty, Peter, of committing some kind of crimes. But the children, the fetuses, he says, all right, all right. You know that statement I made about God murdering a bunch of people? Well, let me qualify that by saying some of those people might have deserved it. But the babies didn't deserve it. The fetuses... The unborn children, they didn't deserve it. Now what's he saying? Implication of this statement? Well, we atheists are much more moral than you because we think that your God ordering the death or causing the death of innocent children or fetuses is immoral. Oh, hold on just a second. The atheistic community doesn't have a problem killing children. They, they might claim to, but when you start to analyze their writings... They have absolutely no problem killing children. In fact, they advocate it on a regular basis. Now, I want you to listen to them say. Peter Singer, who in 2008, Dan Barker in his book Godless, said this man was the leading 
ethicist in the world. I just watched a video between him and Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins said to Peter Singer, Peter Singer, you are the most moral man I have ever met. Peter Singer says this, if we compare a severely defective human infant with a non-human animal, a dog or a pig, for example, we'll often find the non-human to have superior capacities. Only the fact that the defective infant is a member of the species Homo sapiens, only the fact that it's human, leads it to be treated differently from the dog or pig. Species membership alone, however, is not morally relevant. If we can put aside the obsolete and erroneous notion of the sanctity of all human life, we may start to look at human life as it really is. He says, all right, guys, let's take this situation. You've got a dog or a pig over here. You've got a human over here. This human's defective. Most of the time, we save the human. Why? Well, for the sorry, illogical, erroneous fact that it's just a human. But species membership is not morally relevant. You don't save an organism just because it's a member of one species or not a member of another. Now, watch what he says. The, that a fetus is known to be disabled is widely accepted as grounds for abortion. Now, hold on just a second. Dan Barker, what were you saying it's immoral to kill? A, a what? A fetus. But now Peter Singer says, if we look inside of a mother's stomach and we see that a fetus is disabled, well, we would think that would be moral to kill that fetus, that unborn child. Now, hold on just a second. No, we would not. If we needed to, we could start right here and have an hour and a half discussion of abortion and how human life begins at conception and how the sanctity of all human life is instructed in the Bible and we as humans following God's instructions are to view all human life as sanctified and only God having the prerogative to decide when that human spirit needs to return to him. But follow with me in this argument here. He is saying it's widely accepted grounds for abortion. No, it's not. But in his circle and in the atheistic community, yes, it is. You understand what I'm saying there? Now, watch what he says. Yet in discussing abortion, we say that birth doesn't mark a morally significant dividing line. I can't see how you can defend the view that a fetus could be replaced before birth, but a newborn infant couldn't. Now, he's talking to us in that, yeah, we agree totally with him in one sense, in that if you say that you could kill an unborn child then you have to say also that the day after that child is born, you could kill it too. Now, of course, what we would argue as Christians, looking at the biblical view of the sanctity of human life from conception is, okay, yeah, maybe you're seeing that, no, you can't kill that unborn child at eight months. You can't kill that unborn child at seven months. You can't kill that unborn child at six months or five months or four months. But what he's saying is, oh, yeah, you can kill a, a four-month-old unborn child. And guess what? Birth doesn't mark a morally significant dividing line. Once that child is born and he's one second older than he was right before it was in the belly, Singer says, that doesn't mean a thing. Now, that's logically correct. It doesn't mean a thing. But watch what he is then saying. If disabled newborn infants weren't regarded as having the right to life until, say, a week or a month after birth, well, that would allow parents, in consultation with their doctors, to choose on the basis of far greater knowledge of the infant's condition than is possible before birth. You know what? We abort children at eight months. Why don't we just stretch that, he says, to once the child is born, let that child live for a month, and if the child's not developing like we want him to, let's throw him in the garbage and replace him. I am not making that up. That's exactly what he's saying. And this is in writings of an ethical life. Now listen to what he concludes. Nevertheless, the main point's clear. Killing a disabled infant is not morally equivalent to killing a person. Very often it's not wrong at all. Hold on just a second. I thought you guys were accusing the God of the Bible for being immoral for killing an unborn child, for bringing in the flood and killing millions of babies. But you have just admitted that the man that Dan Barker calls the leading ethicist in the world says that if you have a human and you have a dog or pig and that dog or pig is going to be more advanced is going to be more beneficial to society. You save that dog and pig and you wait till that human baby is a month old and if he doesn't turn out to be how you like him, you throw him in the garbage and you replace him and that's not morally wrong at all. So where did you guys get a foundation upon which you were going to tell us that our God was immoral for doing something? Continue with me. 
An infant with severe brain damage, this is a guy by the name of James Rachels. If you'll read the title of his book, Created from Animals, The Moral Implications of Darwinism. Notice that word, the moral implications of Darwinism. You know what an implication is. If A is longer than B and B is longer than C, then A is longer than C. Now, you don't have to have that explicitly stated. The implication is just as true as the explicit statement of it. Now what he is saying is these are the implications of Darwinism. What that means is what you can imply from Darwin is just as explicit and just as real as what's explicitly stated. It's just as real as what's explicitly stated in the theory of Darwinism. Now watch what he says. An infant with severe brain damage, even if it's surprised for many years, it may never learn to speak. Its mental powers may never rise above a primitive level. In fact, its psychological capacities may be markedly inferior to those of a typical rhesus monkey. In that case, moral individualism would say, see no reason to prefer its life over the monkeys. Some unfortunate humans, perhaps because they've suffered brain damage, aren't rational agents. What are we to say about them? The natural conclusion, according to the doctrine we're considering, would be that their status is that of mere animals. And perhaps we should go on to conclude that they may be used as non-human animals are used, perhaps as laboratory subjects, or as food. He says, let me tell you one of the implications of Darwinism. Here's the implication. You're an animal. There are animals out there. You're going to have a severely defective infant. Hey, do you ever do experiments on monkeys? Could that be helpful to the human society to do some experiments on uh, defective infants? Okay, yeah, well, you can do whatever you want to with those, just like you could do whatever you wanted to with an animal. In fact, not only could you do experiments on them, but you could use them as food. It, do you see me making that statement up? Am I saying that somebody out there says it? No. I'm quoting for you the exact statement from the moral implications of Darwinism by Dr. James Rachels. Now, the idea that our God is immoral because he kills children and the atheistic community has some kind of right to say that because they value human life is absolutely positively wrong. Sam Harris, many of us consider human fetuses in the first trimester to be more or less like rabbits having imputed to them a range of happiness and suffering that does not grant them full status in our moral community. You know, I guess what? You got a human fetus, it's in the first trimester, that's about like a rabbit. You experiment on rabbits, you do all kinds of stuff with rabbits, you could do the same with a human fetus because we have not granted them full status in our moral community. Well, yes, we have. Some of us who are following God's word and who are dedicated to the sanctity of all human life have granted them full status in our moral community. The atheistic society has not. Now, Barbara Burke says, among some animal species, infant killing appears to be a natural practice. Could it be natural for humans too? A trait inherited from our primate ancestors. Charles Darwin noted in The Descent of Man that infanticide has been, quote, probably the most important of all checks on population growth throughout human history. My parents had a coon dog, had a pedigree as long as your arm. The puppies from that dog, the dog's name was Queen, they were going to be worth about 800 to 1,000 bucks apiece. Queen had 12 puppies in her first litter. My parents thought, yes, it's $1,200 right there. She ate every one of those puppies but one. She thought she could only raise one puppy. She had eight the next litter. She ate them all but one. Among some animal species, infant killing appears to be a natural practice. Could it be natural for humans too? A trait inherited from our primate ancestors, Charles Darwin noted, in The Descent of Man, that infanticide has been, quote, probably one of the most important of all population checks on population growth. Now listen to me. For an atheist to attempt to stand on higher moral ground than the God of the Bible with this type of reasoning is insidious and it is ridiculous. Now, we need to then address what's the difference here. Because what we're saying is the atheistic community doesn't have a problem killing babies, so before you let them scare you with their tactic of the God of the Bible kills babies and we don't, hold on just a second and hold their feet to the fire and force them to admit, oh, the God of the Bible kills babies and so do we. But our killing of the babies, according to them, is better. Well, let's just see if that's the case. What is the difference between the God of the Bible's causing, bringing about, condoning the death of anybody, including innocent children, 
and the immoral atheistic idea of killing a child if it doesn't meet a certain grade level or intelligence level or a physical activity level that we would like to see. What's the difference? Well, I'm going to show you that there is a very big difference. Dan Barker in his book Godless says that since there is only one life, this life that we atheists have, each decision is crucial and we are accountable for actions right now. Life is dear. It's fleeting, it's vibrant, it's vulnerable, it's heartbreaking, it can be lost, it will be lost, but we exist now, we are caring, intelligent animals and can treasure our brief lives. Now according to Barker, what is the one thing that a human being has? This life, physical life, as long as a human being is here, that's all. That's all you've got. According to him, there's no afterlife, there's no uh, retribution, there's no punishment, there's no reward. You've got this life and you've got this life only. Okay, so according to his philosophy, when you kill an unborn child or a child that's a month old that's not reaching its full potential according to the atheistic community, what are you taking from that child? Everything. You're taking it all. You are exterminating every single ounce of that child's existence. Now, you're not, really. But in your mind, you think you are. So you understand that what the atheistic community is saying here is that, okay, as an atheist, I believe that this life is all you've got, and that means I'm forced to conclude that it's all that these unborn children have or all these children that are born with uh, deficiencies have. And so I think it would be right to take everything that you can take from a child. Now, uh, let's look at this from a biblical perspective. Is he right that this life is all that there is? Well, no, absolutely not. He is wrong that this life is all that there is. From a biblical perspective, we understand, according to Genesis through Revelation, you could take any number of verses for this point, but Matthew 16, 26, what's it profit if a man gains the whole world, loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? You understand the point there. There's something that's much more valuable than his physical life. What is that? Your eternal soul, your immortal soul is probably better to use. The word eternal most of the time is associated with God being from everlasting to everlasting. You're looking here at the concept that once a child is conceived, God puts into that child an immortal soul that will last forever much longer than his physical body or her physical body is here on this earth. So, according to the biblical perspective, when God takes the physical life of a child, what does a child have left? immortality. Now the atheist says, yeah, it's all right to take everything you've got. God says, I'm giving a child an immortal soul, and when I take that child's physical life, I'm leaving the most valuable thing that that child has. Now continue with me. Is it true? Is it a fact according to the biblical perspective that sometimes death is better than physical life? That's true. It's a fact. Now, I can give you several verses for that. You go to Isaiah 57, 1 and 2. This is one of the most powerful verses in all the Old Testament to verify this point in my opinion. Listen to it. The righteous perishes, and nobody takes it to heart. Nobody really stops to think about what's going on. Everybody gets to the funeral, and they're all sad because the guy who was 22 years old who looked like he was going to be a righteous worker for the Lord is now dead. Nobody stops and thinks that the merciful men are taken away while no one considers that the righteous is taken away from evil he'll enter into peace they shall rest in their beds each one walking in his own uprightness you know it's sad when a righteous person dies to us but if you would take a minute to stop and think that righteous person doesn't want to swap with you that righteous person is in paradise and they don't want to come back the other day I was sitting at the funeral of one of the most godly men I had ever met in my life he spent about 74, 76 years of his life doing the Lord's will, probably converted tens of thousands of people, and we were at his funeral, and it was one of the best funerals I had ever heard preached, and I was thinking to myself, do you know that this man who is now in paradise in Abraham's bosom doesn't want to come back? we got a lot of people here on earth that are sad and his position is going to have to be refilled by probably four people to do the job that he was doing himself, but he's not coming back and he wouldn't swap with you. Because the righteous is taken away from evil, they shall rest in their beds. 
they shall enter into peace. Consider that, Isaiah said. Psalm 116, 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Now hold on just a second. You mean to tell me that God views as precious the death of people who are righteous and who are his saints? Yeah, he does. Why? I finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me, Paul said, a crown of life which the Lord our God shall give to me and not to me only, but to all who love his appearing. Oh, guess what? When someone dies and they're righteous, they have come to the end of the course, they have endured to the end, and they're going to get to live forever. Now, in God's perspective, is that good for that person? Sure. You know the verse that's probably most famous along these lines, Philippians 1.21 and following. Paul said, for me to live is Christ. And to die, that's gain. I'm hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Oh, it's not just a little better. You know, it's not just inches better. It's not just a few centimeters better. It's not just a foot or two better. It's far better. I'll nevertheless to remain in the flesh be more needful for you. And being confident of this thing, I know that I'll remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith. Was it better for Paul to die for him? Sure. So, now watch this. Is it the case that sometimes it's better for a person to die than to live? Now, atheism cannot say that because atheism doesn't recognize the reality of the immortal soul. And that's where they come into a total misunderstanding of God's justice. If you refuse to recognize the reality of the immortal soul and you refuse to take the Bible as an organic whole that explains that to you, then you're going to misunderstand how in the world a God can be moral and allow the death of a child if you believe that taking a child's physical life is taking all that there is. And yet you would, as an atheist, say, it'd be all right for us to decide to do that, but not God. But see, once you admit the reality of the immortal soul and the fact that it could be better for a person to die than to live, then just ask this question. Could it have been better for the children who God killed for them to die than for them to live? Okay, now, if you're thinking, and this is think tank, and I can tell lots of you are sticking with me. If you're thinking, and the atheist is then backed into a corner with that truth, What's the next thing that he says? Well, he says, if that's right, then why don't you just kill all the little kids? Why don't you just wait till a person's baptized and when they come up out of the water, you shoot them in the head, send them to paradise? If you're going to follow your teaching out to its logical conclusion, then you would be morally obligated to bring about the best for a person. Okay, hold on. Once they are forced to admit that you could have a better situation, that's what they come back with. But then there's a very simple answer to that. Whose prerogative is it to decide when human life has done what human life is supposed to do? Well, you know exactly the answer to that. Little children, admittedly, according to the Bible, when they die, they do go to heaven. Now, some Calvinistic teachers say that this is not the case. In fact, Martin Luther himself said that if a child was not baptized after it was born, that child was born with original sin and would be condemned to hell if it was not baptized. That is an anti-biblical teaching. That is not what the Bible has ever taught. The Bible consistently maintains the picture that innocent children are just that. They're not born with anyone's sin. If you were to look in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18, you would see that Ezekiel says, the man who sins shall die, the son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. That's an unbiblical, wrong idea that babies are born with any sin. In fact, as you look at it, assuredly I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now... Why is it that only God has the prerogative of life and death? You remember when you were reading the book of Job, maybe, Job on numerous occasions begged to die. He wanted to die. His death would have been better for him. He cursed the day he was born. He was so shriveled with the disease that Satan had stricken him with. His skin was black 
and flaking off of his bones. He had boils from the tip of his toes to the top of his head. He was sitting in the town dump, scraping boils that were filled with worms off with a broken piece of pottery. He was so disfigured that his friends for his whole life didn't even recognize him when they saw him. They were so appalled at his visage that they could not even make a statement for seven days. And Job begged to die. But he didn't kill himself, did he? Now there's a reason he didn't kill himself. Because he understood that God is the only one who has the prerogative over human life and human death. Now, Dan Barker says this, morality is simply acting with the intention to minimize harm. He says, the way to avoid making moral mistakes is to be as informed as possible about the likely consequences of the actions being considered. He says, all right, we're all trying to act morally. The way to act the most morally is to know the most about the situation. Huh. Who knows the most about the situation an all-knowing God so according to Dan Barker the way that you make a moral decision is that you assess every single possible consequence and when you know the most about the situation then you are the one that's in the best position to make a moral decision oh guess what we've got somebody like that we've got a God who knows everything that has ever happened and listen to me everything that will ever happen and every possible consequence of any action that could ever be made. Who is in the most moral position to decide when a physical life needs to stay going or when a physical life needs to end? God. Number one, it's God's prerogative because He knows everything. And number two, it's God's prerogative because it's His physical life that he gave in the first place. You understand what I'm saying? Every single thing that you've got is God's. The air you breathe, the earth upon which you tread, the fabrics that you make your clothes out of, the food that you eat, the synthetic stuff that you use to make your glasses and contact lenses, the water that you drink, the cells in your body, the physical substances that compose your body, it's all God's. Can God determine, because He owns physical life, when a human's physical life needs to be ended? Absolutely. Who else could? Nobody. God is the only one that has the prerogative over human life and human death. You read Ecclesiastes 12, 7, then the dust will return to the earth as it was and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Now you know those uh, children that the atheists are claiming God immorally abused in the Old Testament because he allowed them to die. Those children who when they died went to paradise, would any one of those children who were taken out of an ungodly disgusting Canaanite society and ushered into paradise, would they want to come back? And yet, who is the atheistic community claiming that God has sinned against? Those children that wouldn't want to come back. Does God have the prerogative over life and death? Absolutely, positively. Can anybody else claim that prerogative? No, they cannot. Is it immoral for God to, to take the physical life that He gives to any person and replace it with an immortal life of eternal bliss? You can't argue that, can you? And thus our God remains the all-perfect, absolutely moral, righteous, just judge of all the world, of all the earth. Sure appreciate your kind time and attention.